Well, hello, everyone. My name is John Paul. I'm from the AAA, and I've been at AAA now for about 36 years. We were chatting about what my job actually is these days, and a lot of it is doing this, doing virtual presentations. And um, at AAA, I do a, f a lot of different things. I'm a child pastor safety technician, um, a child pastor safety instructor, which means I help uh, caregivers and EMS folks and police and fire department. I teach them how to put car seats in and put them in safely. I'm also a driver improvement instructor and lead instructor, which means I teach other people how to teach the AAA driver improvement program. I'm an ASC certified technician. I, before I came to work at AAA, nearly a lifetime ago, 36 years ago, I worked as an automobile technician. I still maintain my certification and I try to help people with their car problems. Unfortunately, I don't get to do, the, do it in person, but I answer a lot of people's car questions. So I'm sort of a automotive ad, advocate for a lot of people and try to help them with their questions. And whether it's buying a car, repairing a car, thinking about the latest technology like um, electric vehicles, hybrids, plug-in plug -in electric vehicles, um, things like that I could try to help people with. I road test about 50 different cars a year. I don't get to drive every single car that's out there, but I drive a good variety of them. And I've been doing that for quite a long time now. So I have a pretty good background in uh, cars and what people think of them. But the program tonight is um, Ask the Car Doctor. And I have a PowerPoint presentation prepared. And these are kind of common questions I get from people either in presentations like this, or they could be uh, emails I get from people and I'll have my email address up at some point. Um, I write newspaper columns for the Providence Journal in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, the Boston Globe and Boston.com in Massachusetts. And for the last six months or so, I've written a column for uh, New York Newsday, which comes out on Fridays. So if you get Newsday, look at the automotive section, and I write a column in there. So in addition to that, I also host a little radio show on Saturdays. So a lot of so everything I do kind of centers around cars and that aspect. So that's why I'm here today. So uh, just to be clear, if anyone has a specific question, uh, as we're even going through the PowerPoint, just click your camera on and unmute your microphone. And when you click your camera on, I'll know that you have a question. Or if you click it on early and you don't have a question, you don't, just wave and let me know. And uh, Or you can always type a message in the chat and I'll get to those questions uh, probably as we go on here. So I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. So hopefully you have seen something that says, uh, car care, ask the car doctor. And, uh, and again, these are questions that come up on a regular basis that I answer almost weekly sometimes. And one of the first ones is about oil changes. Oil, oil is the life's blood of your car, it's very important that you change the oil. When I first started in a repair garage, we changed customers' oil every 3,000 miles or every three months. And we did that forever and ever. And in some people's cases, we even did it more often. But the question is, do you need to change your car's oil every 3,000 miles? No, not at all. Even though you might go someplace and get your oil changed, and it might be a sticker that says, you know, good for 3,000 miles, you don't need to. Today's oil lasts a lot longer. Uh, filters are better than they've ever been. And more importantly, engines are made better than they've ever been, which is one of the reasons why you don't need to change your oil quite as often. So uh, how often do you do it? It's really based on what it says in the owner's manual. Uh, we have a couple of cars in our household, an older one and a little bit newer one, one of them, it says change the oil every six months or every 7,500 miles. The other one says once a year or every 10,000 miles. Is there any real difference in the two engines? Probably not. One manufacturer just thinks it's more important to change the oil a little bit more often. So um, the next question, is synthetic oil worth the extra money? 
And I get this question a lot. Um, synthetic oil is more expensive. I just pulled a couple of ads off the internet. I'm not kind of picking on one thing or the other. Um, uh, home of the 39.95 conventional oil change. And this one's a Kia dealership and it's a synthetic oil change for 89.95, which is actually a pretty good deal. Um, I just called a local repair shop to add, I was just curious about changing the oil on the Volkswagen that we own. And it was, it takes an extra quarter of oil. So it takes a, actually a, a little more than an extra quart. It takes about six quarts and a little bit. And it uses a little bit more expensive filter, but nothing outrageous. And it was going to be $150. So is it worth the extra money for synthetic oil? I think so. Uh, synthetic oil has some real benefits. Um, so what's the difference between regular oil and synthetic oil? This is one of the better diagrams that I've seen. Um, the picture on the left uh, with the metal ball bearings, if you think of that as the molecules of inside oil, and what it shows is they're all uniform. On the right-hand side of the picture are different size ball bearings, and that's the molecules inside conventional oil. So in other words, they're different sizes and they flow differently because of that. So I used to try to describe this as if you put, if you took a pool table and you put some pool balls on the table, a football on the table, a soccer ball on the table, um, a basketball on the table, a ping pong ball on the table, and then you put all the balls sort of together and you put a flat piece of wood or something on top of it and tried to roll the wood across the balls, it'd be really hard to do. If you just took the, if you just took five or six pool balls that are all the same size, put that same flat board on top of it and tried to roll it around, it'd be nice and smooth and easy. And that's exactly what synthetic oil is. And synthetic oil, um, although it costs more, and the picture on the right is actually, I think from some oil change service, but I liked what it said because it cited a AAA, AAA um, program that we did. But it's, the question is, which one is better, synthetic or conventional oil? And it says in this one, uh, five quarts of regular oil costs about $28. The average cost of that oil change is 38, wherever that place is. Synthetic oil, the average cost of five quarts of oil is about $45. And the cost of that synthetic oil change they're saying about 70. And that can vary quite a bit. Um, but what was interesting, why I liked the picture was it says synthetic oil outperformed conventional oil by 47% in AAA tests. What we did was we ran engines for a really long period of time on synthetic oil and conventional oil, disassembled them to see what kind of wear took place. And what we found was a lot less wear when people used synthetic oil. So there's definite benefit. Um, one of the other questions is, is all gasoline created equal? I always used to think so. I always used to be kind of a believer in gas is gas. You see the same tanker truck pull up at the corner gas station, and then maybe you see it over at the mobile station, and then you see it someplace else. There is a difference. Uh, all gasoline is not created equal. Uh, gasoline has different additives in it. And there's a type of gasoline, and it's called top tier gasoline. And if you go to the website toptiergas.com, you'll find top tier gas stations. Typically, they're um, major brands, but not always. Um, top tier gasoline has extra additives in it that help prevent carbon from building up inside the engine. The picture, on, the picture that's on the screen shows a valve of an engine and it looks nice and clean. The valve on the right is the same amount of hours using non-top tier gasoline. So it builds up, builds up with carbon. And as it builds up more and more, a couple of bad things will happen. First off, the carbon acts like a sponge, absorbs gasoline. And if it gets really, really bad, the valves won't close properly. So top tier gasoline is good to use 
Some people use a gasoline additive instead. Um, near where I live, there is a stop and shop supermarket that sells gas. There's a Cumberland Farms convenience store that sells gas. There's a Sitco and a BP station. The Sitco and BP stations typically are the same price as any of the other stations. They're top tier gasoline. I will try to go to those gas stations when I can. Other times I go to the other places. Do I, you know, I'm, anybody who knows me knows I'm kind of cheap and I'll go get, you know, coffee for a dollar at Cumberland Farms and uh, get gas while I'm there because it's on this, it's maybe in the direction I'm heading. So the good thing about top tier gasoline is it has a cleaning benefit. So when you replace, when you, if you're not using top tier gasoline and you start to, it will actually clean your engine. And so if you use it sometimes, that's good. That's good. It's a benefit. Um, if it doesn't cost any more, even a better benefit. If it makes your engine run smoother and better, better still. Um, again, I always thought gas, all gasoline was the same, but some AAA studies we did showed absolutely it isn't. So do I need to use premium gasoline in my car? Depends. The um, picture on the left says 91 octane recommended, 87 octane minimum. Well, again, we did a bunch of studies. We put cars on engine dynamometers, so sort of something like a treadmill for your car. And we ran the car and we ran it with uh, specially formulated 87 octane. We knew it was Octane can vary a little from station to station. So this was fuel that was tested to be correctly 87 octane. And what we found was that in every case, there was no real benefit of using premium fuel. In the very rare case that there was a smidge of better gas mileage, it was offset, way offset by the extra cost of that premium fuel over the regular. What I liked about this picture on the left was it says 91 octane recommended. The picture on the far right shows the typical gas pump, 87, 89, and 93. So if your car recommends 91 and you wanna put what's recommended, you put 93, right? Because 89 is not 91 and 93 is better than 91. So what do you do? You put the most expensive gasoline in and again, what we found out was there was no benefit for that. The little picture in the middle says premium fuel required. Those are the ones you absolutely use premium gasoline. And it might say premium, it might say 93, it might say 92. Those are cars that require premium fuel because if you don't use it, you could possibly damage the car, but you could also avoid the warranty. So if you have a performance car like a Porsche or something like that that requires premium fuel and you don't use it, or a, or a hot rod Subaru like the Subaru WRX STI that requires premium fuel and you decide you don't wanna spend the money for premium fuel and you have a problem, you can look into how the car was running, whether it was knocking and pinging, they can determine if you're using the right gasoline and it can actually void the warranty. So do I need to use premium gasoline? If it says premium gasoline recommended, you don't have to. If it says premium gasoline required, yes, you do. How about if it just says 87 octane? Will it do any harm if you use premium gasoline? It could. Uh, this is probably 10 or more years ago. The Toyota Corolla, one of the best little economy cars going, solid as a rock, always good. What they found, what Toyota engineers found was when you put premium fuel in it, it tended to cause carbon inside the engine and it caused the engine not to run as good as it should. So go whatever the manufacturers recommend. So recommend 87, recommend 91, not necessarily. So um, if your car, you know, if you drive a Audi or a BMW or a Volkswagen or a Chrysler with a turbocharger and it says, 90, it says premium recommended or 93 recommended or 91 recommended is not necessary. You won't cause any harm. The engine's designed in such a way that it can adjust any possible engine timing issues and it'll keep the engine from doing bad things. 
how often should my car's tires be rotated? Um, I will be honest on this one. Whatever the manufacturer says, I ignore it. I get out and look at the tires on my car on a regular basis. And if they're wearing smoothly and evenly, I leave them alone. Typically, every six months is a good time to rotate your tires. But again, look at the owner's manual, see what it says. So it might be every 5,000 or 7,500 miles. What I do like about rotating tires a little more frequently is that it's a good excuse to take the wire, tires off and look at the brakes. And there's nothing better than inspecting the brakes on your car by having all four wheels come off and look at the brake condition. So depending on what you know about your car and how it's maintained, um, it's kind of, that's one of those ones that's up to you. I was um, on a webinar with one of my coworkers and an engineer from Michelin. And he said he never rotates the tires on his car. He checks the tires periodically, same as I do. In fact, he doesn't even align his car. He doesn't even get a wheel alignment done because he feels if the tires are wearing good, why spend the money on it? Um, engine coolant is the second life's blood of the vehicle. If oil's the first, engine coolant's the second. And some people think that engine coolant can last forever. And it doesn't. It does need to be changed periodically. Even though the couple of pictures up here, um, the middle one says permanent antifreeze. Well, Way back when, before I ever worked on cars, you kept your car from freezing in the winter time from adding alcohol to the water in the radiator. The alcohol would not freeze, but it would evaporate over the course of the winter time. So you had to add it regularly, you had to add it periodically. And the picture on the far left, where it says protect your car non-rust antifreeze American alcohol. Well, that was an old metal sign I saw in a gift shop somewhere in Florida. And I took a picture of it. And if you zoomed in real close, you could see they wanted, I think, $55 for it. And I wasn't going to buy it. Um, but it was a thermometer and uh, which didn't work anymore. And it was but it but I like the idea it said American alcohol, because that was the original antifreeze. That's what you put in your car in the uh, in the old days to keep it from freezing. The picture on the far right is um, Valvoline Max Life engine coolant. It's it, They call it high mileage for whatever reason. It's actually a container of 50-50 coolant and water. It's pre-mixed, which makes it easy, but it didn't bring the cost down. In fact, you get half as much antifreeze and twice as much water for the same price. But like it says there, it's you know typically good for five years or 50 or 60,000 miles. Um, check the coolant in your car. We'll go over how to do that in a bit. And um, look at the condition. If it's starting to get dirty and cloudy, have it tested. You can test it a variety of different ways, but it doesn't last forever, even though at one point it was called permanent. It is not permanent. It doesn't last forever. Another popular question I get is usually right around the holidays is, if I add an aftermarket device to my vehicle, like a remote car starter, will it void the car's warranty? And it will not. You are protected as a consumer by something called the Magnuson Moss Law, which basically says if you add something to a vehicle and they claim it will void the warranty, they have to give you that thing for free. So this came about way back when, when people put alarms in their cars before the factory did it for them. And, uh, but it's still, it's still, I was at a car dealership about three years ago with someone. We were cars, we were kind of car shopping together. And the person wanted to have a remote car starter put in their Honda CRV that they were buying. And the person at the dealership said, oh uh, yeah, we, we can do that for you. It's about eight or $900. And uh, the person looked at me and I said, oh, you can do that cheaper. And the salesperson or the sales manager or whatever he was said, oh, if you put that remote starter in and it's not a Honda product, it'll void the warranty. Well, that's not true. About a month or so later, I was at a um, electronic stereo store, place that sells car stereos. And they do a lot of remote car starters. And I was telling the story about the Honda and the remote car starter and all that. 
And he said to me, who was the dealership? And I told him, and he said, oh, that's kind of funny because we do all of their remote car starters for them. So the remote car starter that I wanted to have put in that the claim would void the warranty was not similar to, it was exactly the same one that the Honda dealership was going to put in, put in by the exact same person. So it's not going to void the warranty. So as long as it's put in, installed correctly, it won't void the warranty. Another question is a lot of cars in the past 25 or 30 years had rubber timing belts. The rubber timing belt connects the crankshaft of the engine to the camshaft of the engine. You don't need to know what all that does, but you need to know that it requires maintenance. And just like fan belts on cars, rubber timing belts will fail. The picture on the right is uh, just shows a rubber belt all starting to fray. The picture on the left shows a rubber timing belt versus a metal timing chain. Metal timing chains typically last forever. Rubber timing belts last somewhere between, depends on the car, 35 to 120,000 miles. Um, 35 on some older Volvos, 105 or 115,000 on some Hondas. But it is critical that they do get replaced because if the timing belt fails on the majority of these engines, what will happen is the pistons in the engine collide with the valves in the engine and it will absolutely destroy the engine. So uh, you want to make sure you follow the maintenance instructions on that. Are there things you can do yourself to maintain your car? Absolutely. Checking the oil, checking the life blood of the engine. Easy enough to do, warm the engine up, shut it off, let it sit for a minute, find the engine oil dipstick, pull it out, wipe it off with a clean cloth, reinsert it, pull it back out, check the oil level. If it's full, leave it alone. If it's low, add to it, uh, use the proper oil for the car. Checking engine coolant's almost as easy. Um, there are all different types of coolant reservoirs. This happens to be, the picture in the middle happens to be the one that was in my previous car. And it's a little container with a cap on top of it. You check the coolant when it's cool and there's a minimum maximum line, you add the proper coolant. When I started repairing cars a whole long time ago, there was basically one kind of coolant, it was green. There was a couple different manufacturers. That's really about all there was. Today, there are at least eight kinds of engine coolant. Try to get the one that matches your car. Brake fluid is important to check. Um, maybe not add to, but at least check it periodically. Uh, the picture on the far right is a brake fluid reservoir. Most of them today on newer cars are translucent, so you can check the brake fluid level. If you do need to add brake fluid, it's one of those things that you have to do. You shouldn't have to do it. That's what I really mean to say. As the brake pads start to wear, the brake fluid will go down somewhat. But if you notice the brake fluid level is low and you add to it and it's low again, there was a brake fluid leak and that needs immediate attention. That's not anything you want to take a chance with because if the brake fluid leaks out, guess what? You'll have no brakes. So a little bit more things you can do. Check the tire pressure. You should check tire pressure once a month. Um, gasoline prices have certainly gone up. Uh, when your tires are underinflated, you can lose precious gas mileage. And it doesn't take much. A couple pounds here or there in each tire is enough to chew up a little extra gas. Check tire tread. Um, I, there's a picture of a penny and a quarter. We always used to say check tire tread with a penny if it doesn't come up to at least Lincoln's head. It's time for new tires. Now what we say is check the tire tread with a quarter. And it's not because of inflation, in case anyone's wondering. It's more because of the depth of the tread. Um, the distance between the edge of a quarter and Washington's head is about 430 seconds of rub, 430 seconds of distance. The difference between a, that and a penny is 230 seconds. It makes a real difference in how the vehicle will perform. And we'll get to that in a minute. Um, check and change the uh, engine air filter. Something easy enough to do in a lot of different cars. And just to go back to the tires for a minute, a brand new tire um, for uh, stopping from say 60 miles an hour might take, you might be able to stop in 100, 160 feet according to this chart. 
Um, a tire with 530 seconds, 195 feet. 430 seconds, 205 feet. But look what happens when it gets down to 230 seconds, which we used to consider okay. You know, that was, that was a tire that was worn out, but time to replace. 250 feet, so almost 100 feet difference from a new tire. And that would be the difference between a crash and one that didn't happen. So can you, know, can you do things to maintain the appearance of your car? Absolutely. Uh, hand washing versus waterless washing versus a automatic car wash. Anything you can do to get your car clean is good. I prefer washing a car by hand with water and a lot of soap. Um, just easy, easy to do. Uh, if you have a hose and you're, you know, you can do it at home. If not, a uh, automatic car wash. I'm not crazy about automatic car washes in one sense and the other sense I am. I like automatic car washes. They recycle the water, so they're not wasting water. I don't like automatic car washes because they recycle the water. And if the filtration system's not working properly, it can actually put dirty water where it doesn't belong. Uh, washing and waxing car. Waxing is important. There's all kinds of wax. There's spray wax and hard wax and carnauba wax and liquid wax and ceramic waxes now. Uh, they all do different things. They're all the, the easiest ones to apply or typically the ones that don't, don't last as long. Uh, the harder ones to apply last a lot longer. Um, you can improve, you can main, by maintaining the appearance of your car, you're also maintaining its value. Uh, years and years ago, a coworker of mine wanted to go trade his car in and he went to go trade it in. He was offered not a lot of money for his car, but his car was awful looking. The paint was all faded. The interior didn't look good. It still had fast food wrappers in it. Uh, tires looked awful. So we spent an afternoon one day washing and waxing his car, cleaning the interior, you know, putting armor all on the tires, wiping down the dash, really vacuuming and shampooing the interior, uh, buffing, out the, buffing out the paint so it had a shine to it again, really cleaned it up, and then went under the hood, kind of cleaned up under the hood a little bit, didn't change any of the fluids, but we topped everything off. The oil was down about half a quart. The transmission fluid looked okay. The antifreeze was maybe a little bit lower than it should be, but we topped off everything. He took that same car, traded it back in, and he was offered about $1,500 more for it because it looked good. No other reason. It looked good. And if it looked good, that meant the car dealer would assume he took pretty good care of it, but also that meant he didn't have to have it reconditioned to look good so he could put it out for sale. So it does protect your investment, so it's important to do. So will road salt really ruin my car? Salt sort of, but there's a lot of stuff we put on roads today. Uh, if you, as I recall my high school chemistry, salt is sodium chloride. We have substituted salt with calcium chloride, which is better because it lowers the temperature of water uh, so it doesn't freeze, so roads don't get slippery. And in some cases, we replace calcium chloride with magnesium chloride. Magnesium chloride is great. They can pre-treat roads with it. So when it rains or snows, the roads don't freeze. It is very acidic to metal. Metal bridges, metal cars, anything that's metal. Although it really helps trying to keep your car looking good. No, it doesn't at all. It doesn't help your car looking good at all. It, what it does is it chews up your car, it eats up your car. So it keeps the roads looking good, but it doesn't do anything for your car. So if you do, especially at the end of winter time, if you're out and you notice your car has kind of the sticky white stuff all over it, go to the car wash and wash it off. And if you and even do the undercarriage wash, um, get it off from underneath because brake lines can rust away because of salt. Any, any place where this salt, calcium, magnesium chloride can build up, it can cause rust and rot. Uh, can I upgrade the headlights to my car? I hear this question all the time from people. And this is a picture of a Jeep. The headlight on the left is a conventional headlight. The one on the right is an LED replacement bulb. It looks great. It looks brighter, throwing more light, totally illegal. There is not one LED replacement bulb that is 
that is DOT legal to upgrade from a conventional headlight bulb. You can buy them. You can buy them in auto parts stores. You can buy them online. You can buy them everywhere, but they are not DOT legal, Department of Transportation, National Highway Traffic Safety, whatever you want to call it. They're not legal because they're not designed for that vehicle. And even though they're brighter, they don't aim the same way. And sometimes I'll hear, well, they're close. Well, they're not aimed the same way. I was talking to an engineer from Sylvania Orstrom, the lighting manufacturer. They do everything from you know, lights in your house to lights in your cars. And I said, what about LED headlights? And they're like, if we could only design one that was a perfect replacement, we would and we would sell them all day long. But you can't. And even though you can buy them, they're actually designed for novelty purposes, or they'll say not for on-road use. They might say they might say DOT accepted, but it'll say for um not for on-road use. The same time you might see a car with um, colored headlights, pink headlights, green headlights, definitely illegal. You might see a headlight with a um, ring of light around the outside of it. And it might even match the car. It might look kind of nice. You, you have a, a green Jeep and good headlights and a green ring around the outside of the light, illegal. Can't do it. Not supposed to be there. Uh, sometimes they're called halo lights. Sometimes they're called angel eyes whatever the case is, they're not legal. Um, they should be on a switch. Now, if you're sitting somewhere parked and you want to turn them on, that's fine. But if you're driving down the road, you could be pulled over because of it. So where do you get car advice? Well, you can ask me. You can ask the guy in the neighborhood or your you know, Uncle Frank or you know, somebody who seems to, you know, Uncle Frank's got a, uh, got a looks like a 56 Chevy there. He's a guy that you know works on everybody's cars. Now, the best place to get car advice is from the car's owner's manual. That's the people who wrote, who built the car. They wrote the book. That's where you get car advice. That's the best place to go. Now, if you don't want to go there, you can call me or you can email me. My email is jpaul at aaanortheast.com. Even easier to remember is aaa.com slash car doc. And I will, I answer every question I get, whether it's about cars or just about anything else. And if I don't know the answer, because you're asking me about car loans or extended service contracts that AAA may sell, um, I'm not an expert on those, but I'll connect you up with an expert that will have that answer. Somebody asked me about passport requirements going to Canada the other day. No idea, but I got an expert that answered the question. So easy enough to do. So my email again, jpaul at aaanortheast.com. Uh, easy way to find me, aaa.com slash car doctor. You can see some of the things I've written, car reviews, things like that. Uh, but there's a spot there that says, um, I think it might say ask the expert or something, but just type, type in a question there and you have to put in your email address and I will... I will respond back, usually within the same day. Um, sometimes I take Sundays off, but usually within the same day. So I want to stop sharing a bit here.